in redox reactions, the electrons of the, the um, reactants are transferred from one to another um, in order for the chemical reaction to occur. Um, in order for us to be able to characterize and study these particular types of reactions, we have to be able to keep track of those electrons. And remember, we talked about the idea of an oxidation number um, being the way that we can keep track of the electrons and where they're located. We're going to learn today a little bit more about how to, we're going to look at how to calculate um, what those oxidation numbers would be. So we're going to look at two different types of compounds. The first one's going to be carbon dioxide. You should notice right away that in carbon dioxide we have nothing but nonmetals in this compound, and so that's a covalent more molecular compound. Um, in that compound, we have atoms that are joined together. They are joined together by covalent bonds or shared pairs of electrons. And in that case, the atoms do not have a charge. Um, they are neutral atoms. They are held together by these shared pairs of electrons, these covalent bonds. And um, they're held together by those covalent bonds. Um, and they don't have a charge. However, we can keep track of the electrons using oxidation numbers. So even though the atoms don't have a charge, the oxidation number um, will allow us to keep track of where the electrons are at. In this compound, we're going to find it's going to be an ionic compound. In there, there, everything is an ion. The ion has a charge. And the charge will be the oxidation number. That's going to be the difference between the two. But fundamentally, we're going to treat them in, in exactly the same way. So with carbon dioxide, we've, we talked about the idea in class that the charge of the compound equals the sum of all the oxidation numbers of all the atoms that are in that compound. So the charge is equal to 1 times whatever the oxidation number of carbon would be, because there's one carbon atom. And there are two oxygen atoms. So the one carbon plus the two oxygen atoms, we take those oxidation numbers, add them together, that's to equal what the charge would be. In this compound, the charge, the charge is zero. If there were a charge, it would be in the upper right-hand corner, in which case this would be an ion instead of a neutral molecule. And so we can put zero in there for charge. The other thing that we can substitute is the oxidation number of oxygen. Because we talked about the idea that our assumption is going to be that oxygen is always a minus 2. Even though, in reality, um, oxygen is not always a minus 2. Um, there are some cases where it, is, it can have an oxidation number other than that. And so we are using our assumption about oxygen. And oxygen is always going to be our helper. Um, because we're going to know its oxidation number, in this case um, being a minus 2. And so we do that, and we solve this expression. We find that carbon would be equal to plus 4. So if we were writing down, trying to determine what the oxidation numbers of each of the elements would be, we'd say carbon is a plus 4, and each oxygen is a minus 2. Because what's interesting to us is, um, or what's useful to us, is the oxidation number for each atom of each element. Not all the elements together. So if we say all the oxygens added together would be minus 4, that would be true. But we're interested to know what each element would be. So this expression allows us to determine that or figure it out. You might be able to do all this in your head. That's perfectly fine. Now we're going to move to an ionic compound. I know it's ionic. I know it's ionic because there is a metal in it. There's both a metal and a polyatomic ion. Those are, should be two screaming alarms for you to say that's an ionic compound. Um, and if you aren't able to, to choose or distinguish between ionic and covalent, you need to make sure you get that down now. It's a very, very important skill to have in chemistry. <coughs> so we know it's ionic. We know that everything in there is an ion. We have copper ions and we have nitrate ions. You might say, wait a second, what do you mean nitrate ions? Well, you should by now have figured out, or you should be able to figure out or identify a polyatomic ion when it's in a compound. 
And that was that list of polyatomics we looked at a long time ago when we were looking at naming of compounds. If you've forgotten about all that material, that is all going to be useful again today. We're bringing all that back. So when we're doing oxidation number, those naming rules for ionic compounds will be very important. So it's particularly important that you're able to identify those polyatomic ions. So in this case, nitrate ion is NO3 minus 1. Now you might say, you never see it written like that. It's always just minus, because whenever we don't include that number there, we, what we are saying is that it is a minus 1. We don't normally put the 1 there, but we know that there's a charge. So therefore, what must the other ion be? What's the copper ion in this compound? Well, two different ways that we learned to figure it out. First one is we say nitrate is a minus one, and there are two of them. So it's a minus two charge total, and all the charges have to add up to whatever the charge of the compound would be, the zero. So two times minus one is minus two, so copper must be a plus two ion. All right. Um, the other way to figure that out is to say, okay, there's one copper and there are two nitrate, and you can reverse multiply those charges upward, and we could say nitrate has a charge of one, copper has a charge of two, and then because we know metals form positive ions, all right, and that's just something you're going to have to know about metals. We talked about that. Metals form positive ions, then the nitrate would have to be a minus one. That's another way you could determine what the charge would be in that copper. And we have the charge on the copper, and remember we said if we know an ion and it's monatomic, the charge on that ion automatically is the oxidation number, so copper has an oxidation number of plus two. For nitrates, a little bit more complicated. We've got to take this back, because remember, this is nitrogen with three covalently bonded oxygens to it. It just so happens the whole thing has gained one electron, so there's an extra electron in there that it has gained. So when we have things that are covalently attached, we've got to come back and use this method. We can't just figure out what the charges are through, a, through um, examination, a quick examination. So, in this case, we say the charge of that ion is minus 1, and I have no idea why I put parentheses around it, um, and that's equal to 1 times whatever nitrogen is, nitrogen, there's only one of them, plus 3 times whatever oxygen is. Remember, we also said oxygen is always a minus 2, so minus 1 equals N plus 3 times a minus 2, because oxygen is always a minus 2 in the case that we're going to look at. And when you solve that, nitrogen should equal plus 5. This is the one that we looked at in class, so it should seem familiar to you. Um, so now what do, we, what do we know? Well, we know that copper is plus 2. That's its oxidation number. We know that nitrogen is plus 5, and we know that oxygen is minus 2. So we have calculated the oxidation numbers for each of the elements in that compound. Now this is going to become very important because we're going to start looking at reactions using different compounds. And we're going to have to try to identify how many electrons are being transferred, what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, what's the oxidizing agent, what's the reducing agent. It's all going to come back to being able to recognize what the oxidation number will be for each of the elements in all of the compounds. That's the next step for this, um, for using oxidation number.